They land on the treacherous beaches of Normandy, France. If you put troops on a beach from which there is no retreat, and there's almost no retreat from beaches, then they will fight because they have to fight to survive. And you can see this at Normandy. What those men went through was almost unbelievable. When you see those beaches and you see what those men had to face, it was it's absolutely sobering to, to realize. And it makes you very proud to be an American, as far as I'm concerned. How they survive and ultimately defeat the Nazis is predicted in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Sun Tzu says, all warfare is deception. If you can deceive your enemy before battle, you are more likely to win. Imagine I got 10,000 soldiers, you got one million. Right, so what I had to do to counter you, right, I had to deceive you, right, into splitting out your forces into more diverse groups. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower takes this principle to heart as he prepares to invade Europe during World War II. His invasion strategy at Normandy is one of the most daring in history, and it's foreshadowed in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. By 1944, Nazi Germany knows the Allies are coming, but they don't know where or when. It's very clear at some point that in order to win World War II, uh, the Allies would have had to invade the continent. Uh, and the build-up in England is the only place they could build up from. It meant it was going to come somewhere on the coast of France. The only question is where. There are only three feasible locations where the Allies could land. The Pas-de-Calais, the Cherbourg Peninsula, or the Normandy beaches. The reason why this was true is that the Allies were absolutely certain to only land on a beach that could be protected by the air power of the, of the fighter planes <clears throat> that could fly out of southern England. The range of these fighters was 400 miles. Therefore, any landing site had to be within 200 miles of these beaches. But even with air support, the Allies know a beach invasion of Europe is nearly impossible. To succeed, they must employ more of a go strategy than a chess strategy. So instead of a direct attack, the Allies follow Sun Tzu's principle of deception and convince the Germans the attack will not occur at Normandy. One way Normandy is comparable to Go is the fact that the deception is involved. Uh, as you're playing Go, it's, um, you are signaling by your moves which parts of the territory you're going to try and conquer. What the Allies were able to do with the clever use of deception as well as actually clear military logic was to convince the Germans that when it came, it would come at Pas de Calais. And when in fact, they planned to come at Normandy. It's called Operation Fortitude, and it's one of the most complex deception campaigns ever attempted. The Allies create a fake army that appears ready to strike at Calais. They use inflatable tanks, planes, and trucks to fool German photo reconnaissance. They would move the tanks and the trucks around at night and they would have men with rollers actually making the tracks so that it would, there would actually be tracks in the ground so that it, it would look like there was a real movement of troops during the night. The Phantom Army needs to be seen and heard, so Allied Army personnel broadcast endless hours of fake transmissions about troop and supply movements. On the one hand, you would think it'd be a bit of a funny job because you're just sending bogus traffic. But on the other hand, it's a very important job that if they were lax in it or they didn't do it well, it would defeat the whole purpose of the deception plan. Eisenhower shows the Germans his fake army, but keeps his real fighting force an absolute secret. For weeks, they are successful in their deception campaign. But one month before the D-Day invasion of Normandy is set to begin, the Allies fear their secret is out. 
British counterintelligence officers discover five crucial Normandy code names in a single newspaper crossword puzzle. Overlord, Neptune, Utah, Omaha, and Mulberry. British agents track down the creator of the crossword puzzle, a 54-year-old teacher named Leonard Daw. And they interrogate him, and he gets very indignant and says, you know, am I not allowed to choose the words that I want for a crossword puzzle? And they, uh, they press him, but at the end of the day, they figure out that uh, he is actually telling the truth and that the words were actually just an accident. With the scare behind them, the Allies must now actively sell the Germans on the Calais invasion threat. They turn to one of Sun Tzu's favorite methods, spies. Sun Tzu says it is essential to seek out enemy agents who have come to spy against you and bribe them to serve you. In the art of war, double agents are the most important spies. Double agents begin as the spies that your adversary has sent to spy on you. When you find them out, you don't jail them or execute them. You hire them. You give them lavish rewards. And what they start to do then is they continue to act as if they're spying on you. But the information they feed back to your adversary is misinformation. During World War II, Nobody uses double agents better than the British. Their program is called Double Cross, and one of their key double agents is a Welsh naval contractor named Alfred Owen. When the war breaks out, he's picked up right away, and they offer him a, a deal. Either come over and become a double agent for us, or essentially you go to prison and many of them were executed. And he gets the code word, snow. And so when the Germans try to infiltrate their first wave of spies in September of 1940, the Germans radio Snow and let him know that these four agents are coming in. And of course, they're met with the British reception committee right away. Double Cross is so successful that British intelligence is able to turn or imprison nearly every spy sent by Germany during the war. These double agents, with code names like Garbo, Brutus and Tricycle give such convincing misinformation that the Germans not only believe the invasion is coming to Calais, but it's the Normandy landing that's the diversion. Sun Tzu says, the way a wise general can achieve greatness beyond ordinary men is through foreknowledge. Sun Tzu teaches the importance of deception and foreknowledge to uncover the enemy's intentions. The Allies gain foreknowledge by breaking German codes. For years, the Germans believe their encoding machine, called Enigma, is completely unbreakable. It can scramble a message 150 million, million, million ways. But with the help of a Polish mathematician, British intelligence does the impossible. They are able to decode an intercepted German message within hours. They call their code-breaking system Ultra. Through Ultra, the Allies know what the Germans are thinking, what their perceptions are of the battlefield, and their view of what's happening. Thus, they're able to feed German spies information that reinforces those misconceptions. Sun Tzu would prize Ultra for its ability to read the mind of the enemy. The other war essentially is using the mind to fight the war. Meaning to say that it is a mind-to-mind -mind battle. So in order to win against the enemy, you must be able to read the mind of the enemy. But sometimes, knowing what your enemy is thinking creates moral dilemmas. According to a British intelligence officer, on November 14, 1940, the British decode a German message about an impending attack on the English city of Coventry. If Churchill tries to protect Coventry, he could tip off the Germans that he's reading their messages. It must have been a very, very difficult position to be placed in and a very difficult decision for him to make. And in this particular case, he was looking at the long-term Allied victory and he essentially sacrificed the, uh, the citizens of Coventry that were lost that night. Coventry is devastated from the air. The destruction is so complete 
the Germans coin a new phrase, Coventrated, to describe total obliteration of a town. The story is controversial, as there is no hard evidence to support the claim that Churchill was warned about the Coventry attack. As D-Day approaches, the Allies discover through Ultra and their network of spies that the Nazis still believe the invasion will come through Calais. Still, attacking Normandy will be difficult as the Germans establish defenses all along the coast. Sun Tzu would praise the Allies' preparation for the landing and their mastery of deception, but he would seriously condemn what they do once they arrive. Sun Tzu says, when a falcon strike breaks the body of its prey, it is because of timing. When torrential water tosses boulders, it is because of momentum. Sun Tzu believes even the most well-executed attack can be ruined if momentum is lost. The Normandy invasion shows that Sun Tzu could have predicted its outcome some 2,000 years earlier. After months of preparation and deception, Eisenhower launches his attack against German-occupied France. 150,000 ground troops jammed onto hundreds of small landing craft leave England and cross the English Channel. They'll land at five different beaches in France, codenamed Juno, Sword, Gold, Utah, and Omaha. As the landing craft approach the beaches, 15,000 aircraft and 7,000 ships provide a coordinated aerial assault on the beaches. At some of the landing sites, the Allied soldiers meet very little resistance. But at beaches like Omaha, it's hell on earth. For many of the Allied soldiers inside the landing craft, these moments before the door opens will be their last. A case of incredible courage in the face of overwhelming horror. I mean, uh, as the if you think about it, the landing crafts came up to the beach, and as they came up to the beach, the troops inside the landing craft could hear the machine guns tackering on the outside. The enemy machine gunners switched to what they call FCL, Final Coordination Line. They're going to put as much machine gun fire on the front of that boat, so when it drops, bullets go right through and kill two or three guys at a time. A lot of guys just died that way. Many don't make it off the boats. For the soldier lucky enough to survive the initial machine gun barrage, the nightmare is just beginning. He then has to cross 200 yards of mined tidal flats, weighed down with wet, heavy gear. Then get through another 100 yards of barbed wire beaches. It's three football fields of death and destruction as German machine guns shred fellow soldiers and friends. If you ever get a chance to visit Nomaha, it will change your whole view about the world. It will change your whole view about America. It will make you realize what incredible heroism was displayed by those guys there. The Allies survive on death ground exactly the way Sun Tzu predicts, by fighting together and never giving up. There was unmitigated horror, and still they kept coming. And you, you wonder, you, you know, why, how, how do you make people do that? And perhaps Sun Tzu is in fact instructive here. You make them do that because there's no other alternative except death. What are you gonna do, turn around with equipment and swim back to England? There's no plan for evacuation unless you're wounded. There's, there's no way you could refuse to get off the boat. Uh, so in a sense, once you put that number of guys on the beach, uh, you're following Sun Tzu in that you're putting an army in a situation where it must fight or die. Uh, and they fought, and they fought well, and, and they survived. The Allies also benefit from another Sun Tzu principle, the poor judgment of their enemy's leader. 
Sun Tzu says it is essential for victory that generals are unconstrained by their leaders. The Allied command structure gives total authority to General Eisenhower as supreme commander of all forces on the Western Front. Beneath him are four commanders, one for the Navy, Air Force, the U.S. Army Group, and the British Army Group. In the business world, this would be a very clean org chart with well-defined responsibilities. The great advantage that Eisenhower had that he could work with all sorts of people, and there were a huge number of prima donnas, and on both sides, he was able to work with these people and get them to work for the common good. One would expect a dictator like Hitler to have an even more efficient chain of command than the Allies, but it's just the opposite. Hitler sets up a confusing system of overlapping authority. He wanted to make sure that no one person beneath him had all of the information and or all of the control over forces at their disposal. And so by divvying it up, it always ensured that Hitler was the one that actually made the final decision on the disposition and the allocation of troops. General von Rundstedt holds the title of Commander-in-Chief for forces in the West. But the Navy and Air Fleet each had separate command chains that aren't under his control and often don't cooperate with each other. The Waffen-SS, a separate military arm that fights alongside the German army, answers to Himmler, and Rundstedt has only indirect control of the mechanized divisions. Four tank units are under his command, but the remaining six are split between Army Groups B and G. It's a complete mess. Hitler's leadership style and the chaotic command structure in the German army render Hitler a very cooperative adversary for a Sunzian type campaign. He is constantly interfering in the decisions of his subordinates, the generals who should be acting objectively and professionally in trying to defend France against the Allied invasion. One of Hitler's greatest blunders is how he deployed his prized panzer tank divisions. Some generals believe the panzers must be close to the beaches to knock the invading troops back into the sea. Others think the tanks should be held in reserve so they can be deployed in force wherever the Allies choose to land. Since none of the generals have the authority to make the call, the decision falls to Hitler. And being Hitler, he made all the wrong decisions. He put one panzer division in Holland and another panzer division at the Bay of Biscay, both of which were entirely out of any range of a possible landing. And he put the rest of his panzer divisions back some distance from the beaches. Hitler's failure is a perfect example of why Sun Tzu says the enlightened general must be free to conduct war without interference from the leader. When you look at the strategy for the German defense in France or in Normandy, it's very divided over how the defense should be arranged, what forces are actually available to defend the beaches, and what forces are actually available to reinforce the beaches or reinforce the German forces at the invasion point because no one person has control of all of the forces as Eisenhower did on the Allied side. The Allies achieve the impossible. Through bravery and determination, the troops are able to take all five landing sites at Normandy. Despite all of the complex planning that went into the, the invasion of Normandy, it was the small unit tactics and the buddies fighting side by side that wins the Battle of the Beaches, and that's consistent throughout history. Sun Tzu would have marveled at the timing and execution of the invasion. But soon, the Allies encounter a new and completely unexpected enemy. A labyrinth of giant, impenetrable hedgerows in what is known as the Bocage country of France. It looks like the Allies have pulled off this amazing, miraculous feat, and they have. They've landed an army on the beaches of Normandy. But then they get bogged down in the hedgerow country. They had not anticipated that. Despite the fact that the reconnaissance aircraft had photographed these hedgerows, the Allied planners simply assumed that these were like the hedges in a suburban backyard four or five feet tall, maybe. But these ancient hedges, dating back nearly 2,000 years, are 20 to 30 feet tall and extremely thick. They can't be climbed, tanks can't maneuver through them safely, and explosives would give away a unit's position. 
the hedgerow country in Normandy threatens to completely undermine the momentum that the Allies need to build up. The American army is a mechanized army, and you can't move tanks and trucks very quickly uh, through uh, hedgerows that are enormously thick. The Allies' momentum stops dead in its tracks. Forty days pass, and they have only reached their day five objectives. Casualties mount to more than 78,000, and the entire invasion is in jeopardy. But the solution on how to escape this enormous maze lies in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Sun Tzu says, make your enemy prepare on his left, and he will be weak on his right. In Normandy, France, the Allies are getting pummeled in the hedgerows of the Bocage country. Terrain perfectly suited for German ambushes and snipers. The Germans have a word for close order combat in terrain that's very complex and closed. It's called Rattenkrieg. It means literally the war of the rats. It means, in essence, that warfare gets reduced to almost individual combat, one or two men against one or two men, because uh, the terrain, in this case the hedgerows, won't allow you to maneuver, won't allow you to bring your, your technological advances of artillery, air power, mobility to tanks uh, to bear. So the war uh, in the hedgerows was, was a terrible war. It was up close and personal. But perhaps what's most deadly in the hedgerows are the German panzer tanks prowling the maze. The British actually had a pamphlet on how to hunt tanks. They would send out specialized teams of individuals with bazookas or piets, as the British and the Canadian armies call them, in order to actually hunt down tanks and uh, take them out. And the, uh, the manual actually likens it to big game hunting, where you're out stalking a, a tiger or an elephant and trying to take it down. Eventually, the Allies devise a Sun Tzu-inspired strategy to help free themselves from the carnage of the Bocage country. The plan is to lure most of the German forces fighting at the Bocage to the city of Caen, so a weakened force is left behind. Primarily because Caen had airfields and it was closest to Paris, and so the Germans were fairly sure that we would attack through Caen. The Allied plan begins with Operation Goodwood, a blistering barrage of air power against the city of Caen. The Germans take the bait and move many of their panzer tank divisions away from the Bocage, leaving only one and a half divisions behind to hold back the U.S. forces in the hedgerows. The U.S. immediately takes advantage of the shift and strikes with a withering air attack on the remaining German panzer tank divisions. It's called Operation Cobra. Sun Tzu says is, you must behave like the snake. Why? So that when you uh, attack on the front, the back will reinforce the front. You attack in the rear, the front can reinforce that point. And you attack the middle, both sides can come in. So for Sun Tzu, right, it is really that the enemy attacking you, in your, in your responses, you must be flexible. With nearly all of the German tanks destroyed, U.S. forces are able to punch a hole in the German line with artillery, tanks, and infantry. Finally, after weeks of frustration, the Allies break out of the Bocage. The diversion of Goodwood at Caen and the success of Cobra in the Bocage country changes the strategic equation. The stalled Allied momentum returns with a vengeance. Throughout the Normandy invasion, Sun Tzu's invisible hand guides the Allies to victory through their use of deception, foreknowledge, and a superior command structure that motivates the entire army to fight as one. Sun Tzu says, the winning army realizes... And it makes you very proud to be an American, as far as I'm concerned.
how they survive and ultimately defeat the Nazis is predicted in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Sun Tzu says, all warfare is deception. If you can deceive your enemy before battle, you are more likely to win. Imagine I got 10,000 soldiers, you got one million, right? So what I have to do to counter you, right? I have to deceive you, right, into split out. Ranch. The only question is where? There are only three feasible locations where the Allies could land, the Pas de Calais, the Cherbourg Peninsula, or the Normandy beaches. The reason why this was true is that the Allies were absolutely certain to only land on a beach that could be protected by the air power of the, of the fighter planes <clears throat> that could fly out of southern England. The range of these fighters was 400 miles. Therefore, any landing site had to be within 200 miles of these beaches. But even with air support, the Allies know a beach invasion of Europe is nearly impossible. To succeed, they must employ more of a ghost. Your forces into more diverse group. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower takes this principle to heart as he prepares to invade Europe during World War II. His invasion strategy at Normandy is one of the most daring in history, and it's foreshadowed in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. By 1944, Nazi Germany knows the Allies are coming, but they don't know where or when. It's very clear at some point that in order to win World War II, uh, the Allies would have had to invade the continent. Uh, and the build-up in England is the only place they could build up from. It meant it was going to come somewhere on the coast of strategy than a chess strategy. So instead of a direct attack, the Allies follow Sun Tzu's principle of deception and convince the Germans the attack will not occur at Normandy. One way Normandy is comparable to Go is the fact that the deception is involved. Uh, as you're playing Go, it's a, you are signaling by your moves which parts of the territory you're going to try and conquer. What the Allies were able to do with the clever use of deception, as well as actually clear military logic, was to convince the Germans that when it came, it would come at Pas de Calais. And when in fact, they planned to come at Normandy. They land on the treacherous beaches of Normandy, France. If you put troops on a beach from which there is no retreat, and there's almost no retreat from beaches, then they will fight because they have to fight to survive. And you can see this at Normandy. What those men went through was almost unbelievable. When you see those beaches and you see what those men had to face, it was it's absolutely sobering to, to realize. 